In this video, we'll introduce the concepts associated with the Universe Laplace Transform and uh, introduce a couple of useful tools and uh, hopefully get started in terms of the different things you need to know in order to perform an Inverse Laplace Transform. Um, in this video, and you'll discover in most uh, uh, courses, we're going to restrict ourselves to um, looking at functions that are ratios of polynomials. And the reason for doing this is that inverse Laplace transforms for these sorts of functions are typically easier, and uh, it turns out that these show up an awful lot. So we're looking at something like this, where h of s is a ratio of a numerator polynomial over a denominator polynomial. And what we want to do is we want to find the inverse Laplace transform of h of s to get h of t. So that's our goal. Okay. There are other, um, if you have something other than a ratio of polynomials, uh, sometimes it's not that hard to do. For example, if you have um, an exponential term, an e to the s t0 times these guys, then um, that actually works out pretty easy because it's just a time shift. But for now, we're not going to have this stuff. We're not going to worry about this stuff. That'll be uh, a topic for a future video. So the next thing I want to do is talk a little bit about the different tools that you have to take inverse Laplace transforms. Um, Laplace transforms were originally developed to solve problems, uh, to basically solve uh, first or, or solve differential equations. and um, uh, especially in the uh, late 19 or late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, they were developed uh, to solve circuit problems. And the reason they were developed is they make a solution of these problems a lot easier. And so you'll see in uh, Laplace transforms, the I idea typically behind them is to make things easier. You'll recall that the Laplace transform and the inverse Laplace transform are both derived in terms of integrals, or defined in terms of integrals. But you will not find many practicing engineers that work those integrals. And in fact, if you go through a typical textbook that uh, has inverse Laplace transforms, you'll discover that uh, very little of the inverse Laplace transforms involve taking integrals. Instead, people use tables with entries like this, the unit step function transforms to 1 over s. Um, an exponential transforms to 1 over s plus a. And so basically, to take inverse Laplace transforms, what you find people doing is trying to take an h of s or whatever it is they're trying to take the inverse transform of, and break it into pieces that look like this, or like this, or like some other patterns that we'll talk about later. And um, again, the idea there is to avoid working painful integrals. Now, most of the material that you see presented in textbooks on signals and systems hasn't really changed in the last 40 to 50 years, with the exception of the uh, discrete time stuff. Uh, that's actually come into its own uh, typically, well, probably from the uh, 1970s to 1990s. So that stuff has actually changed. But the continuous time stuff and the Laplace transform stuff hasn't changed for a long time. And in the meantime, we have uh, developed computers and computer programs that are actually pretty powerful in terms of uh, computing the sorts of things that you need to compute for a Laplace transform. So if your goal is to take an inverse Laplace transform with the minimal amount of effort and without not necessarily understanding every step of the process, uh, doing it by hand is, uh, well, as I've heard it put, so 20th century. <laughs> 
you can get an automated system that will do it. One of these automated systems is at, it's available for free on the web, it's www.wolframalpha.com. And I'm not necessarily endorsing this uh, as uh, a site, it's actually very interesting. Uh, but I'm not endorsing it for any particular purpose. Uh, it was the first uh, site I found that did automated inverse Laplace transforms, and so I thought I would show it to you. So if you go to the site, it comes up with these uh, really beautiful colors, and you can tell it that you want to calculate something. So for example, I can tell it that I want to compute an inverse Laplace transform, and say I want it to compute the inverse Laplace transform of 10 over s squared plus 2s. I'm assuming this font is small enough it may, may be pretty hard to, to see, but at least this will give you the idea and you can go play with it on your own. So I tell it to compute the inverse Laplace transform of 10 over s squared plus 2s. I hit return. I wait for just a minute, and it gives me a result. It gives me the result that the Laplace transform is uh, 10 times 1 half minus e to the minus 2t over 2. So it would be 5 minus 5e to the minus 2t. And then it even plots it. It tells me, uh, it doesn't really plot it in a way that's all that useful, but it uh, shows me that uh, it starts at 0 and goes up uh, to some value. It also shows me alternate forms that you might find interesting. Uh, it tells me that I can write this as 5 minus 5e to the minus 2t, and so on. So again, if your goal is to compute an inverse Laplace transform with a minimal amount of effort on your part and uh, just be done with it, this is one possible way to do it. Now, it's not perfect in the sense that uh, you can create things that aren't particularly useful. So as an example, suppose I want to compute the inverse Laplace transform of 10 over s cubed plus s plus 1. Okay, So I tell it to do that. It goes out and starts computing. And you can see that I get a result that is m minus 10 times the root of x cubed plus x plus 1 near x is equal to minus 0 0.682328. And uh, that's actually kind of not that useful. Uh, what's going on here is uh, 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 Mathematica, which I believe is the underlying engine here, is designed to work with uh, with symbolic uh, numbers. And so when it actually has to compute a number uh, approximately, it gets really snotty about it and you know uh, says that it's this number near this approximation, but it just wants to remind you very carefully that that's not really uh, the actual root. Uh, MAP, or MATLAB, on the other hand, has no such pretensions, which is why engineers like it a lot. Okay, so anyway, it gives you this result, which is not really all that helpful. Um, it, uh, you know, if you wanted to sit down and work it out now, you could get some, you could get something from it. It shows you uh, the plot of the time function, and you can see that uh, we have a uh, time function that uh, alternates starts at zero and then goes up and down and up and down and gets bigger and bigger, at least the magnitude of the oscillations. And it gives you other alternative forms and stuff like that. Okay, so um, this is one way to take inverse Laplace transforms. It uh, is helpful, uh, particularly when you're learning as a way to check whether or not you've got it right. Although, as you can see, sometimes it gets it kind of uh, messy. Um, it turns out that uh, 
the alpha site will also compute partial fraction expansions, which uh, is the technique we're going to use to um, show how to or to uh, compute inverse Laplace transforms. So let me very briefly introduce that idea before I run out of time. The idea is that this um, ratio of polynomials can typically be represented as something that looks like this. So you can basically uh, break a ratio of polynomials down into terms that are a constant over s minus some root, another constant over s minus another root, and I've actually skipped a couple of uh, important cases. Uh, if you uh, have the right uh, set of polynomials over here, if your denominator factors in a particular way, uh, you'll also have terms that have s minus p1 squared in the denominator. Uh, these roots and these poles may be real or complex, so there's a lot of interesting things that we'll have to worry about. Um, but this is the approach we'll take. Uh, it's not quite as easy as just going to Wolfram Alpha and computing or having it compute all these things for you. Uh, this is the approach that's typically taken in textbooks. Uh, what I don't intend to do is give you a lot of details in terms of how to compute these partial fraction expansions. There's a whole lot of information on the web. If you have Wolfram Alpha uh, compute a partial fraction expansion for you, it will actually go through and explain how it did all the computations. Uh, MATLAB or Wolfram Alpha will uh, do the partial fraction expansion for you automatically. So I'm going to pretend like you do have access to a computer and we'll, we'll proceed in that way. So the next uh, several videos will actually then start um, doing this uh, and computing uh, some inverse loss transforms.